Uh, I will be continuing the series on what Pastor was sharing, living a life of purpose. My voice may sound a little different. <laughs> was hit by the cold this week. Hallelujah. And I was thinking, God, can I go up and preach on Sunday? But God is so good. Amen. I just recovered and I said, I'm going to go preach. Till yesterday I was sick, but I was like, I'm going to go and preach. Amen. So just thankful to the Lord. <clears throat> just bear with my voice. Have you ever asked questions like, you know, why am I here on earth? Or what am I supposed to be doing? What is my true purpose? What is God calling me to do with my life? Those were some of the questions that I asked myself when I was a young girl. Maybe you are asking this morning, what is God's purpose for my life? Maybe you are in a stage of your life, you are confused. Or maybe you know what God's purpose is for your life. Today, as we listen to the Word of God, I pray that it will bring greater clarity in our hearts. And maybe for some of us that are confused, you will receive um, wisdom and understanding from the Lord as you hear the Word of God. And uh, I pray that, you know, God will take us higher and God will take us clearer in living a life of purpose. Can we turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9? 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Who has saved us, that is God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. From these scriptures, we are able to understand that God has called each one of us with a holy calling. God did not only save us. How many of you are born again this morning? You're born again, yes? Forgiven of all your sins, accepted Jesus. But God did not just stop there. He saved us and he has given us a holy calling. God has called each one of us and it is a holy calling. And it is not according to your works, not according to your background, not according to your uh, your tribal identity, okay? But it is according to God's purpose and according to God's grace, which God has given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. The first thing that I want to share is that God has called each one of us with a holy calling. Sometimes we have this misconception that only people in ministry have this holy calling. You know, you're called to preach the gospel, to be a pastor, an evangelist. Oh, those people have a holy calling. But the Word of God here clearly tells us that He not only saved us, but gave us each a holy calling. So everyone is called. If you are an engineer, God has called you to be an engineer, a holy calling to be an engineer. If you're an educationist, God has called you a holy calling to be one. If God has called you uh, to be a musician, it is a holy calling. If God has called you to, um, to be a cook, to be a chef, to be in, in media, it is a holy calling. You know, God does not call us to be part-time Christians, you know, you know, be a full, you know, Christians in the church, but outside, you know, you are a part-time. God wants us to be a full-time Christian. God wants you to carry that holy calling in the church, at home, in your workplace, in your school, just wherever you are, we got to approach life that, hey, you know, I am in the government because God has put me there with a holy calling. Hey, I'm in politics. Hallelujah. And there are so many new candidates that are going in this time. I'm excited. Hallelujah. You know, and, many, and some of them, I don't know many of them, but I know of some of them that are so convicted in their hearts that it is a calling for them to be in politics. So we, if, if today, okay, if there's a, let there be a shift in our mind. If you thought that only pastors and ministers of the gospel had a holy calling, I want to let you know that God has given you a holy calling to be a teacher to be an engineer, a doctor, a musician, a cook, and you name it. And when we approach life from that perspective, I tell you, 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 you do life different. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We have read this verses last week also, Pastor read it for us. I'm going to read it again for us. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
We are God's masterpiece, each one of us. And God has created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Can you say good works? Which God prepared beforehand and that we should walk in them. Well, God has created you. He not only created you, but he has a plan for you. Okay, and the good works. He wants to do good things through our lives. And so here God is saying, I've created you. I have good works already for you. And I want you to walk in it. I want you to walk in it. I want you to fulfill that plan. I want you to fulfill the purpose for which I have created you. Everyone has a holy calling according to God's purpose and grace as we read in 2 Timothy 1. Chapter 1 and verse 9. That's my first point. Everyone has a holy calling according to God's purpose and grace. Well, let me just explain to you. There's a general calling and there's a specific calling. The general calling for us as believers, I'm speaking from a believer's point of view, is that we all live for Christ. We love God. We are called to love God. We are called to love one another. We are called to serve one another. We are called to preach the gospel. And that's the general calling for all of us. But God has specific callings for each one of us. For example, Paul. Paul was called to preach the gospel. But not only that, Paul was called to be an apostle. Not only that, Paul had a specific calling, and his calling was that he was to preach to the Gentiles. And Peter had the calling to preach to the Jews. You get the difference between general calling and specific calling. And as you follow the general calling, you will end up in that specific calling. Okay, follow the general calling. Hey, Pastor, I don't know what God's call for my life. Just do what you know right now. Love God, you know, love one another. You know, follow what the word of God says. And as you follow the general calling that you see and you understand, you will find yourself walking in the specific call that God has for your life. I was just thinking about Dr. Clark and his wife. They came with the gospel of Jesus Christ so many years ago, 150 years ago. Can you imagine, you know, they knew that God had called them to preach the gospel. But God has specifically called them to come to India with the gospel. And when they reached India, they knew that they had to specifically come towards the northeast of India. And they reached Assam. And then they knew that they have to go to the mountains. There was a specific calling. And because they obeyed the specific calling for their lives, amen, today we are the fruit of that. Can you say amen? You see, your calling, when you and I respond to the calling that God has for us, I tell you, you will see great and mighty things. Sometimes we think that the calling is all about us, and I, at the end of the sermon, I will show you that. It is not about you. Hallelujah. It's about Him, and it's about the kingdom of God. So I'm talking about the general calling and the specific calling. And so what is purpose? The purpose is the reason for which something exists. Pastor has explained to us last Sunday as well. The reason for which something exists. And for us as believers, according to the word of God in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, is that our purpose is to glorify God. The reason I live is to glorify God. Calling is something that is a strong inner impulse towards a particular course of action. A strong inner impulse towards a particular course of action. It could be your vocation. It could be your profession. Yeah, Paul, let's look at the life of Paul. Let's turn our Bibles to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15. Like I said, Paul was called to preach the gospel, okay? But he had this specific call from God. Let's read Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. God has called us and he knew us before we were formed in a mother's womb. How exciting is that? I'm a mother, I have two kids, I have born two children, but I didn't really know what God's call is for their life. I'm still praying and helping them discover. But you know what? God already knows you. Hallelujah. Even before you were formed in your mother's womb, and when you were in your mother's womb, that's what Paul tells you, that even before... Uh, you know, uh, he, he separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. 
I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. So Paul knew that God had called him, but it did not immediately happen. Let's go down to verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. So Paul was called, you know, but then after three years, still nothing happened. He went, he met Peter, nothing happened. Verse 21, uh, 22, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. People did not even know his face. Maybe they heard his name that, oh, Saul, who was a persecutor of the churches, you know, now transformed man and, you know, preaching the gospel. But still, he was an unknown face. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then after 14 years, can you say 14 years? I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took t uh, Titus with me. And let's go down to verse 7. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had not been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Why I'm reading these verses is that I want to show the progression that happened in Paul's life. You know, Paul received the calling, but he did not immediately get into the calling. Okay, But there was a time and a period. It was two years, three years, 14 years. And it was then, you know, slowly the body of Christ recognized and commissioned him to go preach it to the uncircumcised. The point that I want to make here is that your calling is progressive. Isn't that good news for us? Many of us, we know what is God's call for our life. And I tell you, I, I can sense it. Many of you can bear witness in your heart, in your spirit, that this is what God has called me to do. But there are only few who follow God's call for their lives. There is a difference. Knowing is different and following is different. And so there is a progression that happens to the calling that God has for our life. There, it's like a journey that you take. And that's why it involves commitment. It involves obedience. It involves sacrifice. Amen, you know. And so you, you may have received the prophetic word, young people, you know. Or you, you may have just received a word and a calling that, you know, God has called you to preach to the nations. God has called you into administration. God has called you to, 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 uh, to be a politician, you know. If it doesn't take place immediately, don't be discouraged. That's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. The call is progressive. You know, do not be discouraged. Keep on obeying. Hallelujah. Keep on serving. Keep on doing the little things that God puts, uh, puts it along your way. You know, many times I see that many people know what God's calling is for their life. But we end up not following the call that God has for our lives. The call of God is progressive. In the last um, few days ago, I was just thinking about how God called me as I received my ordination. I had forgotten how, you know, many years that I had actually said yes to God. And then when I calculated, it is now 24 years since I said yes to God. I was a young girl, and I knew very clearly in my heart, in my spirit, the moment that God said, I've called you for full-time ministry. Did I hear an audible voice of the Lord? No, I did not. But I did spend time praying and fasting and genuinely seeking God and being in the presence of the Lord. And that was when God spoke to me through His Word. And I knew and I knew that God had called me and I committed myself to ministry. But immediately, like Paul, I did not go into ministry. I was still in college and I was doing my college, but I was preaching the gospel in college. I was sharing the gospel to my friends, to my roommates, you know, just to anybody. I was passionate for, the, I was passionate for God. I didn't wait for, you know, the day day that I will reach, get my ordination and I will start preaching, the day that I become a pastor that I will start preaching the gospel? No. Then I went on to Bible school and then on I joined, you know, I got married, I joined, you know, serving the Lord in different capacities. Sometimes it was just cooking, sometimes it was just praying, sometimes it was behind, sometimes it was scrubbing the floor, sometimes it was up here in the front. But different, different, different things. But I was thinking that really, you know, God's call is progressive, you know. And God wants us to be obedient. And God wants us to keep seeking what he has for us. And to keep doing what he brings in our plate. 
What you do today is a building block for tomorrow. So don't despise the little assignments that God gives you. Your calling is now. Don't wait for tomorrow when I get the platform. Tomorrow when I become the pastor of the church. Tomorrow when I become that politician. Tomorrow when I am that person, I will do that. It is now. Can you say now? What has God placed in your hands right now? What are the opportunities that are in, you know, in front of you now? Maybe you are just serving as an usher. Maybe you are just behind the camera. Do it faithfully because it is a building block to your next level. Do not despise the little things, the small beginnings that God will do in your life. Hallelujah. Our calling is progressive and it keeps growing and it gets better and better but I also realized that in my own personal journey in saying yes to God's purpose and calling for my life one of the greatest hindrance that I've found you want to know what it is do you guys want to know <laughs> it's self it's me <laughs> I tell you many times you know we become a hindrance to the call that God has for our lives. Self is one of the greatest hindrance to your calling. You know, studies tell us that around 85% of the time, we are thinking about ourselves. You know, we think, and 15% may be thinking about other things. But most of the time, let's get honest this morning. We think about ourselves. I'm so thankful to the Lord that very early, you know, God took me to Galatians 2.20, and this became like a theme verse for my life, okay? It says, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I tell you, this is a revelation that we all need to get as believers. And for me, I call it the liberation theology. Just, just my personal, okay? That when you know that you are dead, hallelujah, you're a dead man, you know? You no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You're no longer living for yourself. You're no longer living for your uh, family. You're no longer living for your name. You're no longer living for your tribe. With all honor to all of that. But you know, you no longer live. The life you live is that you're living for Christ alone. Hallelujah. I tell you, it is so liberating. Just to know that, hey, come on, I'm living for Christ. All that I do is for Christ. And the life that I live, I live by faith every day. I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me and He gave for me His life for me. So the life that I live is a life of faith every day. Colossians 2.23, another verse. Whatever you do, you do it unto the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Whatever profession that we may be in, whatever calling that God has called you to be in, know that you have one master, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You're not just working alone for your boss. That's what servants do. They only work when the masters are looking at them. You know, the master doesn't come to, it's not at home, the boss hasn't come to office. You're careless about it. You don't care because you're not working for God. You're working for the master. You know, we have to get this attitude in our life. If you want to walk and live the, in the purposes of God, that whatever I do, I'm doing it for the Lord. Hallelujah. And I have a master and I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That will change the way we live our lives. Hallelujah. And I believe that when we know that we belong to Christ, that I no longer live, we are established in our identity. Like Pastor shared last Sunday, that, you, that purpose begins with identity. You've got to know who you are, you know, and you know that, you know, you were born of God, you were a child of God, you no longer live, but Christ lives in me and you live for him. So, so the calling and the purpose of God, that's my next point, is, is greater than yourself. So I said self is the greatest hindrance because you're always thinking about, sometimes about, oh, I can't do it when the Word of God says you can do all things. You're thinking about like, you know, what would people think because you have, you're trying to please people and not God. So, so 
Your calling is greater than yourself. Get it? Your calling is greater than yourself. You may go through failures. You may go through crisis. And I tell you, all of us will go through failures. All of us will go through crisis. And sometimes when we go through all of that, we lose the picture of the purpose and the plan that God has for our lives. And many people give up. Oh, because of the problem, you know, I am not able to move forward. Because of my failure, what would God think about me? Oh, what would, what would people think about me? But remember what 2 Timothy 1.9 says, we are called according to His grace and purpose. You know, God's grace is sufficient for what He has called you to do. Amen. So it is not by your works, not by your own abilities, but it is the grace of, work, of God that is at work in our lives every day, every moment. And so, you know, if you have a problem, if you are going through a crisis, you're going through failure or whatever be it, I want to tell you that God's purpose is greater than that. And I want to share you the story of Joseph. Joseph had a calling and a purpose for God. You know, God gave him two dreams. And the dream was that God, God would make Joseph great. And we know that Joseph's calling was that God would use him to, uh, you know, with, uh, to be a ruler, you know. He just had the gift of administration. He had the gift where he was able to, you know, manage things. And God had great plans for Joseph. But Joseph was young. And when he got the dream, the Bible says that he was 17 years old. Can you imagine how a 17-year-old is? Yeah, I have kids that age. <laughs> yeah. They think different. So maybe he was so excited and he told his dream to his brothers and to his family. And they rebuked him. And some were jealous. Maybe it got into Joseph a little bit. You know, one day all my brothers and, and everyone's going to serve me. So they were jealous of Joseph, and they decided, you know, we are going to get rid of this boy, you know. He's too oversmart. I think that's the right word. He's too oversmart, you know. God had a plan, yes, no doubt. But sometimes we get oversmart as well. <laughs> Am I talking about you this morning? We get oversmart as well. And so Joseph got that, and his brothers were jealous, and they... We all know the story. For some of you who don't know, I'll just try to say it very briefly. This, they, 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 they put him in the pit, you know, and they sold him as a slave. So Joseph ended up in the pit and as a slave in Potiphar's house. Joseph must have been discouraged. He must have thought, huh, was the dream real? Does God really have a plan and a purpose for my life? Did God's purpose for Joseph end because he went through a crisis? No, we know the story. God's purpose for our life doesn't end when we go through a crisis, when we go through failures. God's purpose is greater than your crisis. What happened to Joseph? Joseph began to work as a slave in Potiphar's house. And we know that Joseph, you know, he did so well. He managed his master's house so well that the master put him in charge of the whole house. And the master wasn't even, you know, worried about taking care of the things in the house because Joseph was such a good manager. And the Bible says that the Lord was with him. Four times, if you see in the story of Joseph, you will see that the, 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 the Bible says the Lord was with him. Hallelujah. The Lord was with him. God was with Joseph. Do you know that today God is with us? Amen. His word says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You may be going through a crisis. You may be going through failure. But I want to tell you this morning that God is with you. And he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And I sense that this is a word that somebody needs to hear this morning. So don't give up. Joseph did not give up because the Lord was with him. Hallelujah. The other side of the coin. I was just thinking the Lord was with Joseph. But was Joseph with God? 
Yes, Joseph stuck with God because we know that relationship is always two ways, right? The Lord was with Joseph, but Joseph was also with God. And, and I see that in the scriptures in Genesis 39 in verse 2, it says, The master saw that the Lord was with him. The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph, but also Joseph's master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him. And uh, later on, Pharaoh makes a command about Joseph, and he says, the Spirit of God is with Joseph. You see, when, when God is with you and you are with him, you know what? People can see that. Hallelujah. People see that. You are in your workplace, and sometimes people will tell you, you are so different, oh, brother. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever got that compliment from someone? You are in the moment of a crisis and everyone is panicking. Everyone is thinking, what shall we do? What shall we do? And then, hey, that brother is different. That sister is different. Different. Let's go and get her opinion because the Lord is with you. People can see that the Lord is with you. The point that I want to make here is that Joseph was in intimacy with God. And pastor shared about this point. This is so important. Intimacy with God in fulfilling the purposes of God is so important. We got to be intimate with God. We got to be hearing from God. Intimacy, how pastor, how can I get into intimacy with God? Pray. Everyone say pray. Now, when you pray, what happens is that we come in alignment to His will. Hallelujah. It's not only asking, Lord, you know, give me that, give me this. No, but it is saying, Lord, let your will be done in my life. We are aligning ourselves to the will of God. How, I get, how can I get intimate with God? Read the Word of God. He will begin to speak to you. He will begin to show you what to do. Psalms 119 verse 105 says, The Word of God is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. How can I get intimate with God? Pray. Read the Word of God. And when you do that, you will hear the Holy Spirit speak to us. Intimacy is the key in fulfilling the purposes that God has for our lives. Let us make an, you know, an effort. Let me just use the word. Let us make a decision to say, God, I want to be intimate with you, Lord. I don't want to move unless you tell me you move. I don't want to invest unless you tell me you invest. I'm not going to date unless you tell me, God, you date this person. Yeah, God, God speaks to us. In, every time, He wants to speak to us. Not only when you're in church. He wants to speak to you in your office. He wants to speak to you when you are parenting. He wants to speak to you in your college. Every moment, He wants to speak to us. Intimacy with God. Church, in the last days, okay, we are... I believe living in the last days. The things that are happening around us, we got to be intimate with God. We need to hear the voice of God every day. We need to, we need to hear what heaven is speaking. Because sometimes we can go with trends, sometimes we can go with seasons, but we need to hear the voice of God, hallelujah, and move with Him. So I believe one of the secrets to why Joseph was able to say no to temptation Potiphar's wife loved and liked Joseph because the Bible says that he was handsome. And so she, you know, tempted him to come and sleep with her. But the Bible says that Joseph said no and he fleed from that situation. And I believe that Joseph was able to say no because Joseph was a man full of the Spirit of God. The Word of God says that you walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Many times you want to say no, no to that temptation. And we are trying to say no by looking at it. But you know what we got to do? We got to walk in the Spirit. You got to be full of the Holy Spirit. You got to be in intimacy with God. And you will see that your temptation is already overcome. You're able to say no to that temptation. And in the journey of pursuing God's purpose, we will face many temptations. Sometimes we will face the temptation of greed. We will face temptation of power, money, lust. We will go through many temptations. But as you stay close with God, intimate with God, the Lord was with Joseph. Hallelujah. When you stay close with God, I tell you, we will be able to overcome the temptations that comes along our way. Can you say amen? You know, as I was just, you know, preparing this message and I was reading the life of Joseph, you know, God gave me 
just all this understanding. And I just want to, uh, you know, encourage you to just receive by faith and receive because I believe today some of you are going to receive breakthroughs that you have been waiting for, the struggles that you have been having. God's going to give you wisdom and understanding as you, re as you listen to the Word of God. So Joseph, even though he was honest and, you know, he overcome the temptation, he was falsely accused and Joseph ended up in prison. <laughs> oh, I thought God had a plan for Joseph. I thought God had a plan for me. But now I'm in this prison, you know, and it's not a good place to be in. But here again, the Bible says, if you look in Genesis 39 and 21, 22, you will see that Joseph flourished in the prison. Hallelujah. The Lord was with him again, it says there. And Joseph did so well that the prison master gave him in charge of everything. Okay. But do you know that Joseph did not stay in the prison for long? How did Joseph get to the palace? How can I get to my palace? How can I get to that place that God has for my life? So in the prison, there was the butler and the baker of the king. And both of them were in the prison and they got dreams. Okay. And they were confused about what kind of dream was that. And Joseph had a gift. Okay. Another gift. And the gift was that he could interpret dreams. And so Joseph took this opportunity. He used this gift and he interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker. And after three days, the butler was in the king's palace according to the interpretation of the dream. And the baker died according to the dream. Okay. And so Joseph had told them, hey, you know, whenever, if you reach the king's palace, do remember me. Don't forget me. Remember me. Okay. And so, uh, and so Joseph had a gift, and the gift was interpreting of dreams. And so after two years, the butler had forgotten, but one day King Pharaoh had a dream. And he was so confused about the dream. And he was like, who can interpret this dream for me? Who can do that for me? And suddenly the butler remembered that there was a man in, the dream, in, in prison who actually interpreted his dream, and he ended up in the palace. And so Joseph comes and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh liked what he said. It could bear witness. And that's how Joseph ended up in the palace. The point that I want to make here is that God uses your gift to fulfill your divine purpose. God will use your gift to fulfill your divine purpose. So God has given each one of us a gift, and he gives the gifts without measure. Okay? Every good and perfect gift is from the Lord, James chapter 1, verse 17. So your gift is connected to your calling. Your gift is connected to the purpose that God has for your life. So do not despise the gift that God has given to us. It's important that we acknowledge the gift that God has given to us. And we use the gift that God has given to us. You know, all of us are gifted in so many different ways. Some of you are musicians. You know, some of you, you know, are techies. You can just crack anything. You know, some of you are, uh, are like Barnabas, you're an encourager. Some of you are intercessors. Whatever gift that you have, God will use that as a part of your calling to bring you to that purpose that he has for your life. Okay, so acknowledge the gift that God gives you. And the point, the next point that I want to say is that the gift is not for you. First Peter 4, 11, it says, it is to glorify God. First Peter 4, 10 says, you got to steward that gift. Look here, uh, in, in Genesis 41, I'll take you quickly there. So when Joseph was in Pharaoh's court, and in verse uh, 15, Genesis 41 and verse 15. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have, I have dreamed a dream and there is not one who can interpret. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Yes, Joseph had the gift of interpreting the dreams. But he said, it is not me. But it is God who will give you the interpretation. But God used Joseph. The gift that God gives you is not for you. 
It's for blessing the body of Christ. It's for serving God. It's to glorify God. And so if you're here this morning and you're saying that, you know, Pastor, I don't know what is the gift I have in my life because I was also like that. And I came to the understanding it's very important to know and to understand the gift and the calling that God has for your life. Okay, so if you're in that place, I want you to encourage you to pray and ask God, number one. Okay, be intentional. God, show me. Show me what is the gift that you have given to me. A good thing, number three, is to ask people to help you discover your gift. Because your parents know you, your friends know you, your family know you. If you don't know your gift, you know, suddenly you may, your friend may say, oh, yeah, when you stand up in the stage and you sing, it really ministers to us. When you just share a word of encouragement in the group, you know, it blesses my heart. Maybe you're called to be an orator. You know? Maybe when you just cook the dish and bring it for potluck, yours is always the best. You know, when you pray for me, you're just praying, you know, you're thinking you're nobody. But when you bring, you bring heaven down on earth. So if you don't know what is your gift, you can ask someone who knows you well. And the fourth thing is that steward the God-given gift. Let it grow. Nurture it. Let it grow. If you are a musician, spend hours practicing it, you know. If, you, if you're good in something, grow in that, and just not ignore the gift that God has given to you. Because who knows, your gift will take you to your palace. Hallelujah. Use the gift that God has given to you. Because it will help you fulfill your divine purpose. Another thing is also people. Very important. I have experienced, my husband and I have experienced so much that, you know, the people that God brings along our way has helped us fulfill the God's plan and purpose. Sometimes it is through the word of encouragement. Sometimes it's the prayers. Sometimes it's the support, the resources they've given to us. And it has helped us get to the purpose and the calling. So honor every person that comes along your way. Very, very important. Another key to getting into the destiny and fulfilling God's purpose is that honor the people that God brings, you know. Joseph honored the butler and the baker. And because of that connection, you know, he was able to get to the king's palace. What if Joseph did not use his gift? Because maybe some of you are saying, ah, what if I didn't use my gift? I, I'm not using my gift. What if Joseph was offended with his brothers and he was in the prison? What if he was offended with Potiphar and his wife? Definitely he was not happy. What if he was offended with God? And I see that many people have wonderful gifts, but they are living a life of defeat because they are in offense, you know, they're in pain, you know, because of the crisis they've gone through, you know. I want to encourage you, come out of that. Come out of that because God's purpose is greater than your crisis. Hallelujah. And God is with you and God will take you through. Hallelujah. So Joseph got the dream when he was 17 years old. But when he was 30 years old, the Bible says that he was in Pharaoh's court. So it was 13 years and Joseph went through a lot. Shame, yes. Pain, yes. Betrayal, yes. You know, what else did Joseph go through? Loss, yes. False accusation, yes. All of that Joseph went through. He was in the king's palace. And, you know, we're all human beings, right? Sometimes, you know, you are there, you feel like you've achieved, in the, you're in that place of calling, the purpose, but you still have, you know, some of those things. And as I was reading the scripture, God gave me this beautiful understanding from um, uh, Genesis chapter 41 and verse 51. So Joseph got married. Hallelujah. What a progression, right? Some of you are smiling. Yes. And God blessed him with children. And verse 41, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. The word Manasseh is meaning to forget. In other words, God healed Joseph's heart. Maybe he had gone through a lot of emotional trauma for a person who was out of his father's house, who experienced the pain, the betrayal. You know what? God healed Joseph. That's why he gave his firstborn's name, Manasseh. 
You may go through different things, but I tell you, God will heal you. Amen. God is a healer. He will not just leave you in pain. He will just not leave you in loss, but he will heal your heart. The second thing, verse 52, and the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. God made Joseph fruitful. God will make you fruitful. Can you say amen? That is the faithfulness of God. So stay on track. You may be going through affliction. You may be saying, I When will I overcome this? But stay faithful because God is with you and He will make you fruitful. Amen. What a beautiful story. Hallelujah. And the end, let's go to Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. As I was reading this story, I was imagining myself in the courts of Pharaoh, you know. I was just imagining with, Pharaoh, with Joseph in every step, you know. And, you know, some moments, Joseph just wept. He hidingly went and wept when he met his brothers, you know. The emotional, you know, overwhelming experiences that he had, you know. God just healed him, you know. It's just amazing. And God will do the same for us. Your purpose is greater than your personal fulfillment. Joseph must have thought, hey, I'm in Pharaoh's court. I'm the ruler. I'm the man in charge. You know, Pharaoh made him in charge. And he must have been so fulfilled. He must have been so happy. Okay. But in verse 20, he says here, but as for you, speaking to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Yes, you meant it for evil, but you know what? God turned it for our, go for our good. Yes, I achieved the purpose, okay? Yes, I'm in that place where God's dreams have been fulfilled, the dreams that He gave me, but above all, he, God brought Him to this day to save many people alive. Because of the wisdom that God gave Joseph, he was able to save and, you know, bring a lot of wealth to, Joseph, uh, to Pharaoh, okay, to Pharaoh. And also, he was able to help his family, and not only his family, but the extended family to save so many people. God's purpose is greater than your personal fulfillment. His purpose is way beyond what we think it is. You think God has called you? Like, you know, we're preparing as a church to go to TV. That's the last thing that I want to do, <laughs> personally speaking. But now I have to like, oh, it's not about me. It's about God's purpose. It's about God's gospel that need to go out from this place. You think that you are there, but God's plans are higher and greater. Hallelujah. We need to get this. And he works all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. You may not understand right now why it is happening, how it is happening, but I want to tell you, hang on to what God is doing in your life because at the end, he will do it all for your good. Hallelujah. Because he has called you according to his purpose. Hallelujah. In whatever season of our life that we may be in right now. You may be young and just getting to discover God's calling. You know, I want you to encourage you to earnestly, you know, seek for God's calling for your life. All the young people that are listening to me, the earlier you get it, the better it is. <laughs> okay, that's why I will end up, if I meet you, I'll end up talking to you about this, young people. You know, what is God calling you to do? As parents, we need to pray for our children. And help them discover. And ask God also, what's God calling for their life? You know, for their lives. You know, you may be in a stage where you know that this is what God has called you. I want to encourage you, stay focused. You know, don't let any other thing distract you. Because I tell you, there are so many distractions along the way. So after I got born again, uh, I committed my life to Christ. And, you know, I went to Bible school, you know. I went to Bible school and I got back to Bible school. And I got married and, you know, I wasn't straight into preaching, you know, or any of that. And um, 
uh, there was a prophecy that I received even before I went to Bible school was that, you know, God has given you a gift of preaching. And I was like, ah, you know, because I, I hadn't preached a single sermon then, <laughs> you know. But when I graduated from my Bible school, you know, I had the privilege to be the graduation speaker. Then I knew that, ah, oh, you know, God has given me this gift, you know. And, and, but I got married and I got into ministry, so to say, and, but I never preached in the sense of like, because I was doing all the other things, <laughs> you know. And there were opportunities that came on my way where people said, why don't you do business? Oh, you're so good in this. Why don't you do that, you know? And my husband and I thought, oh, okay, you know, at that point, our church was small. Okay, we didn't have much to do in the sense of um, we had things to do, but not as much as, you know, when there's more, you've got to do more, <laughs> more managing and more stuff like that. So I thought, okay, maybe it's a good idea. But in my spirit, every time I was like, um, oh, doesn't agree, you know. And every time my husband and I, I would pray, it was like, no, nah, you know. And so I just knew that this is not what I'm called for. Yeah, I can make a lot of money there, <laughs> you know. I'm, I can make a lot of money, but this is not what I'm called for. I need to stay focused. You know, so what I'm, as I'm getting older, and many of you will bear witness as well, the older people, now I sound very old, huh? <laughs> yeah, so 24, and now calculate the age. So, uh, so, you know, it has brought me to a place where I'm more focused. If anything I do is that I want to be preaching the gospel, I want to be doing the things of, of the kingdom of God and uh, not the other things. So it's the earlier you discover, the better it is, and, you know, you get to that place. And for that, as a body, we need to do that. You understand, you know, you know parents, we need to encourage our children. Uh, the, 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 the older ones, we have to encourage the youth, you know. And uh, peers, we need to encourage one another to, to run and fulfill the purpose that God has for our lives. And we all will go through crises, we'll go through failures, we'll go through mistakes, we'll go through disappointments, sometimes temptations, you know, betrayals, but whatever be it, stay focused in your track. Can you say amen? Because God is so faithful and God is with you. Hallelujah. My heart, my heart as a pastor for this church is that each one of us will walk into the purpose and the calling that God has for us and we will discover the specific calling that God has for us. So let us live life from an eternal perspective, you know, not just about like, oh, this is what I'm called to do here on earth, by and by, you know, okay, today, tomorrow. No, live from an eternal perspective. God has an assignment for me. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus lived from an eternal perspective and he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent and to finish his work. Not only to do God's will, but also to finish the work that God has sent him for. John chapter 6 and verse 38, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Hallelujah. May we live from an eternal perspective. We say, God, my purpose is to live for you. Not to do my will, but to do your will and to finish the work for which you have sent me for. Can you say amen? So let's close our eyes this morning. Hallelujah. 